Welcome to Full Stack Business Owner. Today, we're talking about the latest news and how it's important for Australian business owners. And if you're not already, make sure you're on the newsletter. The newsletter is designed to enhance your full stack of skills to build wealth inside and outside your business. So if you're not on it, head over to fullstackbusinessowner.com forward slash newsletter, put in your details and get notified every single time we drop one of these episodes. Now, before we get started, let's cue the infamous disclaimer. Charlie here from Full Stack Business Owner. I need to let you know that Grant, myself, and the Full Stack Business Owner team are in no way, shape, or form qualified to give you financial advice or pick investment products. We highly encourage you seek out and engage the use of professionals when making financial decisions or comparing investment products. All right, Charlie, let's talk about real interest rates and their real impact. That was, that was, that's all I got from a marketing perspective. That's what I you like get. It. Clever play on words, Grant. Well <laughs> that done. Was that was good. <laughs> it's like the only time that I've done something good. No, I'm just joking. All right, Charlie. So for people listening, they go, man, I know the interest rate. The bank tells me it's like 3%. Now it's gone up to 4%. Really? Can you just explain to us all, what do you mean by real interest rates? All right, I'm going, to, I'm going to start this one with the story because I feel this is a really important topic for business owners to understand, right? Um, sometimes like the lens you use to look at something makes a massive difference, massive difference. And I'll give you an example. If you're running your business and you're just obsessed with revenue, right? It's easy to chase that, optimize for that, only to then realize, hang on, this profit thing's really important mm. or free cash flow is really important. Uh, so the lens we look at something makes a massive difference in the results we get and also what actions uh, we take. So uh, last week, and I put this in the email, if you're not on the newsletter already, please make sure you do jump on because I think it will be very helpful. I share other insights on there. Um, I was contacted by someone who was basically looking at selling and fire sailing a property. Right? They're going, right, my rates are going up. The cash flow I'm looking at this property as like becoming really, really thin. I'm getting worried. Rates are going to go up further. Like, I think I should sell this right now. And so the idea being that the lens they were looking through is just, well, the bank charges me this amount of interest and the rent I get from this property every week is this and that number's are getting too thin. I don't like it. I'm getting I'm, I'm getting ready to sell. Yep. I'm, yep. Yeah. So, uh, and I can understand for a lot of people who invest for cash flow, right? That is a lens we often use. But when we, again, just use that example, if we get one dimensional and fixated on one thing, we can miss the other opportunities and things that have played. Now, the next thing I'll mention is this person had also, like this property had gone up in value. Like the appreciation on this property was like pretty good. Like in the last year, it's, it's done what most of the country has done and it was about 20%. Yeah. So they've made this really good capital gain. And I'm like, well, if you, if you look at those multiple layers, like, you know, there's still really wins to had here. But this is the most important one and this is the one I want to bring up from here and is the concept of real interest rates. Okay, so the way I think about it and what's really important to understand here, see what I did there? I was going to say, you've done, you've done it twice and I just keep loving it every time you say it. <laughs> impressed. Is the idea is that if the bank's charging you, let's say 5% as an interest rate, but the inflation rate is 10%, well, the debt is eroding faster than the bank can charge you interest. So you're actually gaining quite substantially in that example, 5% per year. So if you've got a million dollars of debt and the inflation rate is 10%, it's eroding $100,000 a year and the bank's only charging you $50,000 in interest at 5%, well, you just made 50 grand. Yep. Like you actually have gained substantially, you just can't see it. It's not tangible in the same way that rent is tangible. And that's what I think makes property a really interesting um, asset class when inflation is there because of the use of debt. Yep. So I think it's a fascinating topic. Now, I started to explain some of these concepts without giving financial advice, I will say, at all to this person and said, like, maybe you want to look at this instead of just looking at cash flow or just looking at revenue, yep. maybe like layer in all these dynamics and see if you still feel the same way about this because maybe you think about it differently now. And after going through that, this person's like, I didn't understand this game. Yep. I didn't understand this is what's happening. And I was like, well, this is 
one of the really interesting things. I try to say really as much as I can because we're on real. Dude, I'm for, I should have a counter. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But the point being is, is that in this type of environment, these are the things we need to start to consider. Like it's not just cash flow, it's that real interest rate, it's the interest rates we're getting charged, it's the profit, it's the appreciation. It's a whole dynamic of these things that comes into being successful. And I think different asset classes do differently in times of inflation versus times of deflation. And all of this coming together is where we need to develop that full stack of skills. So we're not one dimensional, which is why I wanted to bring it up on this topic. Now, I know you've prepared some maths and an example, Grant. So I'd love you to like break this one down so people can make it a bit more tangible. So let's let's walk through it without this turning into like an economics and finance accounting sort of lesson. So the first one we'll talk about is like that bank interest rate, um, which if you ever hear someone talk about like a nominal interest rate, that it's the exact same thing. It's like, what are you paying for the debt? So if you walk into a bank and get a million dollars worth of debt at say 5%, because I can't do maths, that's going to be the most basic I could got. So over towards just 12 months and you can apply 10 years and all that kind of stuff. So just over one year, you'll pay 5% on that $1 million, which is about 50 grand. That's Correct. what most people will look and see. And logical makes sense. That's what it's costing you as, as dollars. When we factor in the real interest rates, and I'm going to use your example, Charlie, if we borrow a million dollars and the interest rate is 5%, so the exact same example we're just walking through, but the inflation rate was 10%, now the difference is actually less. So if you take the million dollars and add a negative five, so 5% minus the 10% inflation, it's actually down to 950000 yeah, so there was a hundred grand of the debt eroded in inflation, fifty grand in interest costs. So this is actually a fifty thousand dollar purchasing power increase in that example. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that is the point. That I think everybody just needs to think about when it comes to this. But can I add something on top? Of course, please? you can. Right. So what happens in year two if interest the inf- I mean the debt is the same. Five percent. The inflation rate is the same. But isn't it interesting that the debt stays fixed and the inflation compounds? Yep. It, it's it, That is like one of the powers of, even if you just look at a short term of, a, of one year or 12 months and just go, wow, that's powerful. But then if you apply the 10 years on top of it <laughs> and you actually go, okay, now I'm getting this concept that you and I have spoken about before, which is like the deflating debt away. <laughs> can I th- throw an example in on this? Chris can. This is that, like, you know, that 10 years is like when we look back at our parents and say, well, they bought a house for a hundred grand. Yep. Like that's how we're going to feel about a million dollars 10 years from now. Yep. Like it's becoming normalized. Like the idea of being a millionaire when I was a kid was like huge. Yep. Now I, I almost think of like, you need to be a millionaire just to get by. Well, you, correct. Like I remember, so my pa- family grew up in Gippsland um, and like houses were like a hundred thousand, 200,000. And now in the town that my parents live, like there are places for millions. And I'm just like, it's an hour and a half away from the city. Like what, what are we, and it's not near like a coastal town and things like that. And I'm just like, this is weird. This is a property market is my initial knee jerk reaction. It's like, well, no, this is now the norm. This is, and it's only going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, well, it's actually, I shouldn't say worse. It's just going to get higher because of inflation. Like it's just going to move up. It's a normal part of the economy. Yeah, It's not a good or bad thing like inflation is. We actually need it, believe it or not. You need a little bit of inflation to keep an economy growing. It's um, interesting in itself, but let's not go there. Now, I do have an interesting question for you, Charlie. And I know that you and I were talking about this before, where when we hear inflation from the news and things like that, like that is that is just inflation that incorporates the prices of kind of everything and kind of merged together. Right, so it's got like your your changes in like the goods and services that people buy day to day, yeah, now food, when, energy, petrol, things like that, all that fun stuff. Now, when we're talking about investing, like how does that impact based on that kind of inflation? Like we've spoken before about how you need to calculate your own personal inflation because you might not have one car or two cars, you might have zero cars, you might not. Uh, rent you might own and have no mortgage so you're you're not susceptible to some of these sort of inflation um, impacts that everybody else has but when it comes to investing that's actually another layer that people really need to think about as well especially for your point around the increasing value in assets yeah so 
to your point, everyone's inflation rate is different. It really is. Like if you have kids in school and school fees keep going up, well, that's an inflation you have to deal with versus someone who doesn't have kids or two cars versus no cars or living in Melbourne and Sydney versus living in a rural area. Everyone's got these different things, which I think is fascinating. But the other side of this is that um, in the case of investing assets, they don't just go up because of inflation. Like it, um, anyone who's looked at property prices could hopefully acknowledge that if property just went up by inflation, all the properties would be the same price. Yep, all the time. Yeah, so there are more desirable and less desirable properties, like supply and demand. And when you look at that, you can see that some properties actually will appreciate, not just inflate. Yep. And I want to be very careful of how I explain that because I think it's very important. So inflation is a factor, but properties as an asset themselves do go up in value if they're high quality properties or more desirable ones from there. So the idea being, if you can buy a property that appreciates and takes advantage of inflation and has an income stream from rent, now you've actually got the ability to win in multiple ways from this asset class. And that's often where I think a lot of people have done really well. Like I look at this now and say some people haven't picked the best properties, let's say they're not highly desirable or anything, but the inflation has them won. Yeah. <laughs> actually made all their money in inflation and other people, they might have one really good property and they never did anything else, but appreciation won from them. Yep. Or someone else bought something and the cash flow won from them. Like there's different games within property. Now, ideally, if you can get all of them working for you, it's what makes property such a powerful asset class. And I'm not going to say the only one, and I'm not saying everyone should invest in property. It's definitely not suitable for everyone. Um, I think it's much like food, right? It's an acquired taste. <laughs> Some people should do different things. But I think this is something that stands out to me, why I enjoy property so much personally. And it's, it's even interesting. Like I know Josh Freudenberg, say, so here we go, pull, a, pull up pol politics, sort of before the election, actually was talking, uh, it was like a press conference or something, and everyone was talking about like inflation and the rising interest rates. He's like, that's, yes, I understand, but let's focus on growing the economy, <laughs> which is your your point of appreciation. Like, it's like, yes, that's fine. Like the inflation will impact the debt that we have as a country and all those things. But if we just continue to grow the economy, <laughs> right, and focus on that as an output, I'm like, that is kind of a decent view when you've got a large volume of debt, which obviously Australia as an economy has, but just to apply different sort of concept outside of houses, that's right. Like that is that appreciation of going, well, how do we continue to increase this? Because then you've got all of the forces at play in one as opposed to just trying to fight down debt. Hugely so. And I, know I like using property as an example to explain real interest rates because I think it's very simple for people to conceptualize. One of, again, one of the things I really enjoy about property is it's a simple business. Um, but I'd almost say people really need to think about how this imply, applies to their business as well, their active business. Because if you're a business that utilises debt or could potentially utilise debt, the same principles apply. So if you're able to borrow money at, let's say, that 5% again and inflation is eroding that debt, you could make some serious gains in your business as well using yep. those principles and concepts. So this might be a fantastic time uh, to take advantage of. And I'll give you an example. What if you're a business that makes um, bikes and you can see that the cost of those raw materials keeps going up? You might go, well, I think, and again, this is pure speculation. I think the cost of bike frames is going to go up 10% a year. I can see I can borrow money at 5% a year. Maybe I should consider loading up on inventory now before prices rise yep. so that I can actually, over the long term, make cheaper bikes. All my competitors are going to have these costs that have increased 10% and I'm going to have a strategic advantage here. So that, that would be an example of like e-commerce or factories, but this can apply to everything. So very, very powerful idea. Just to, to wrap up on this. So the, the key message that I really want people to understand is like, even if it's a 0% inflation, which by the way, we're very, very, very far away from that. Never happened. <laughs> never <laughs> happened. The, your point around that, okay, well, you've still got a 5% interest rate, 0% inflation, and then great, so you're paying the 5%, the which in our million dollar example is $50,000. The appreciation of the property because of demands in the market and all those kind of things is still going to hopefully, as long as you bought in the right place, right time, et cetera, offset that debt side anyway. 
But the target inflation rate for most governments is what, two and a half, three percent or something. So it's not like it's going to be at zero percent for a very long period of time anyway. All right. I do need to unpack that further. This is, I think, very important here. Um, One is like there will absolutely be years that are disinflationary. Yep. It has happened. But you kind of need to zoom out. It's not one year I'm worried about or five even. It's like what's going to happen over 50. Yep. And my belief, especially when you look at central banks have a target in, uh, inflation rate of 3%, yep. they want, they're doing things to make that happen, is that I think I want to uh, be on that long-term trend. Yep. When I hear that, I'm like, I support it. How can I use it to my advantage? Um, the thing that can catch people out, and this is something where I almost want to put like a warning message around this. You might be trying to go, Charlie, I love this idea. I'm going to load up on as much debt as I can. But if you don't have the cash flow to support that debt, that's where you can actually like wipe out. That's a bankruptcy. Um, and in Australia, particularly, like bankruptcy can mean you can't play business anymore. Yeah, like wipeouts are much more serious than they would be in the US. Like um, I, I heard the joke: um, bankruptcies in the US are like um, just like ev- everyone's had them. Like every business owner, they almost like rub them off like hot dinners. In Australia, they're way more serious, and they come with massive consequences in comparison. So it's like I would be very, very cautious of that. So in the example of property, you might be going, well, I'm going to, I'm going to play this inflation game. I'm going to absolutely, you know, I'm going to this, the difference between interest rates Hold and all up. the rest. Hold up. Hold up, cowboy. Hold up. <laughs> if you, don't ha- if you ha- can't make the payments on the loan, that's a wipeout. Mm. So please, and I say this, like, please get a good team around you that are, are very, very well equipped with like what debt is appropriate having the right amount of cash flow and buffers to support that debt and having really, really, really um, good preventative measures in not to compromise that. Like personally, I've got cash flow from my properties that support the debt on its own, right? So my properties can pay their debt and I have buffers in place, significant buffers. So if there are a few years where things are tight with cash, I'll be completely fine. There's no issues there. And I think the point is that it will always happen which is exactly what I wanted to mention. Like there will always be a point where to your, to exactly what you said, like the Reserve Bank of Australia can't sort of always sit it at that 3%, 2.5%, right? They're going to go, great, it's out of control, it's too high and now it's too low and <clears throat> it's going to be this seesaw game, which means that everybody from a, a short-term perspective will sort of feel those. It's like, oh, great, it's great, it's not great, it's, it's great, it's not great, right? They just can't set it there and forget it. But to your point, you just need to be able to weather the storm and have cash flow, have reserves, have that fat built into the assets so that whilst those storms are happening, you're fine. Because I use another pun. (laughs) Really? If you use your full stack of skills and you're, again, thinking back to business, not just obsessing on revenue, understanding revenue, understanding profit, understanding reserves, understanding net free cash flow, understanding cost of delivery, then you will be able to strategically manage these environments with great success. Yep. If you lack skills and go into these environments, fear and anxiety will drive you and you will likely be going through like this person I spoke to earlier in the week of like these panics of, oh my God, I should be selling. I I actually, I think they laughed when I said, I'll buy the property off you right now. (laughs) They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, this is a great property. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm in. And uh, I think when they realized my attractiveness to it, they were like, well, now I don't want to sell it. They recreated their attractiveness to it, isn't it? Fascinating, Grant. Anyway, I, I won't uh, extend this topic too much further. I just feel it's a very important conversation in these times. 100%, especially in what we're talking about and what everybody's seeing in the news right now. So I appreciate us walking through that one. Next one. Interesting. I don't know if you've seen this, Charlie. So online private high schools. So we're not just talking about schools during lockdowns or pandemics or anything like that, where they're like forced into doing these things because they got no other choice. This is by choice. We're actually talking about physical schools who are pushing for this. So for example, we've got Halebury coming out of one of Victoria's first private online schools. Um, and for them, they've actually opened up expressions of interest for tw- their schooling year in 2023. Now, the interesting part, which I don't know if you know, Charlie, In 2021, Halbury actually produced some of the highest VCE results. They actually had eight students achieve a 99.95 and 51% of their students finished in the top 10 across Australia. And that's why everyone was in lockdown, right? That's why they are 2021. Yep. 
in lockdown. So talk about a school that's got street, street cred on being able to be successful at this. Like, does this mean that we've just mastered online learning or is this something more? This is such a powerful topic. So many layers to this. I'm going to go with the first thing is that if if I, as you know, let's pretend I, Halbury is a private school. It's a business. Yep. If I had those types of results from lockdown and when people couldn't go to the school, I would be doing the same thing. <laughs> first mover advantage. Yeah, Completely. Results to back it too. We've got a system to execute remote learning better than everyone else. We've got the ATAR results to prove it. This is a way for them to expand into markets interstate regionally, yep. um, like potentially globally, although I don't know if the Australian schooling system has much value overseas, but in the example, I still look at that and go on, what an expansionary move for them Huge. where they don't need to build more buildings. Like this is like, think of the margin expansion on this if you suddenly don't have to provide like physical room on a premise to support that as a business. Yep. So from my point of view, I'm giving this like, this is Charlie's big tick of approval. This is the stuff I think people should be looking for going forward. This is the post COVID or post pandemic game plan, which is gonna see some businesses absolutely crush it over the next five, 10 years. Yeah, because there's so many businesses that have to support that, right? Like when I first started reading about this, I immediately thought through, okay, what's the impact for this? So I remember at high school, like I had to put my names down and it's like, do you remember doing like preferences? Like I want to do graphics and I want to do business and I want to do this. And then like not everybody gets their preferences so they can't get into that class because there's too many students in that class and all those kind of things. I was like, hang on, wait, there's, there's no limits to classrooms. Like you can have, if a thousand kids want to do graphic design, a thousand kids can do a graphic design. But in addition to that, I get to have the best people teach me these things as well. I'm like, oh, no way. So now the breadth of what you can offer is greater because my school didn't have the greatest facilities. It didn't have all of the facilities, I would say, which means there were some things that we just didn't have on offer. We didn't have certain classes that other schools had. And I'm like, oh, no way. I would have preferred some of those coding classes or some of those other classes that other schools had, but I didn't have that opportunity. So now that's open to me. I'm just like, from a business owner's perspective, I'm like, this is fantastic to support schools through this change. But even for you as a parent, I'm assuming that looking at Jack going, you'll be guilty. I know exactly how I'm going to play this one. Let, let's make that example a little bit wider. So let's say you live regionally. Let's pick somewhere like... Um, uh, Geelong. Go to Geelong. Geelong. Okay. Geelong's still pretty big. I want to go more yeah. regionally. Let's go like Torquay then. Or Torquay Lawn. or Bendigo or something. Bendigo, uh, Bendigo is massive. Yeah, we need cool. a smaller city. We're going to go like Lawn. It's a coastal Lawn. town. Yeah. Um, I imagine there's a high school there at the very minimum, but it's like, it's not going to be Halebury. And oh. I'll laugh if there is actually a Halebury equivalent <laughs> there. I don't have any research. Well, I'll pretend like there's not. That's fine. That's exactly what I need. Pretend. <laughs> I like it. Now, let's say your kid is very interested in coding. They're computer science orientated and maths orientated, but for whatever reason, the school in the local area doesn't have the best teacher at that or the facilities to support that. Yep. Now, the options previously were like boarding schools which separate children from the home and all the rest of it, where now the opportunity to have your child educated in something like a Halebury, where they have the best teacher of coding and uh, the right curriculum or whatever goes into it, I look at that and go, well, this is going to shape economies differently. Yep. Because now you've got people in regional towns acquiring skill sets that previously weren't accessible to them. Maybe the parents couldn't afford boarding school. or So the skill sets that are going to become available to people – at volume from the best teachers, I think is such a powerful thing here. I love that this is happening. Yeah, and it's it's going to drive so much more pressure towards regional, which I know we've spoken about this a lot of just going, well, how great would it be if there were like these satellite sort of tech cities and all these things that people can push out to? And we're already seeing it a little bit happen. But then you've actually got these schools, like so wealthy people – don't have to sort of congregate around like these CBDs just to get at, or to these like schools just to get access to them to say, hey, I, do I have the right postcode? Am I on the right side of the street? Just so my child can go to that school. It's like, well, no, like you have that availability now wherever you are. What, what if you're a, um, a parent and you've been, you've bought into one of these school zones and an opportunity's come up to start a new business regionally or another location? It doesn't even have to be regionally. You're no longer locked in to like the idea of, oh, I don't really want to have to have my kids travel to school an hour every day back and forth. You know, like there's yep. all these interesting thing that changes of like freedom of mobility, I think is really cool here. Yeah. And from a, 
from a wealth perspective, do you see any big sort of opportunities for Australian business owners in this space or even for like wealth creation around this? Like, do you see any sort of macro impacts or anything like that outside of just the opportunity for children? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I have to ask. All right, you ready? I've been thinking about this a lot and I'll tell you why. Um, I don't know if you saw the news this week, all the teachers went on strike. Yep. Wanting bigger pay rises. And they're like, okay, well, you know, you've offered us 3%. We want way more than that. We're, we're worth more than that. I'm not disputing that. I'm not disputing that teachers in the current way of teaching probably deserve more. But I'm looking at this right now and I'm going, you guys don't see what's coming. Yep. So the way teachers are teaching now is Blockbuster, is Kodak. And what we're actually going to see is that these online high schools or way they're going about it are the Netflix, yep. are the digital camera. And what is about to happen is the best teachers are about to get paid really well to teach in these schools so that they can attract the most students for online learning. And I think a lot of schools are going to struggle because, again, using our example, if you're in uh, Lawn, and the high school you've got here has got C grade teachers that don't really care and aren't paid well and complaining and just negative people overall. And then you've got no one wants to go to that school. They all want to go do online learning. Well, what happens to the school? Yep. So that I think there's going to be really, really interesting uh, disinflationary. Um, and I know we talk about inflation a lot. We're going to talk about disinflation where I think over the next 10 years, we're going to need less schools less teachers, there's going to be less cars on the road between nine and, nine and three. three. <laughs> yeah, it's going, to, it's going to shift it all. It's going to massively shift the requirements on learning in a really big way. And I see, I see the, the revenue that you can create from a infinitely scalable, to an extent, I'll say infinitely, infinitely scalable because you still need to support the kids and do all that kind of stuff. But just think about the salaries. Like if the number one cost was the salaries and then the technology to support the online school as opposed to the buildings and maintenance and all that kind of stuff, just think about the draw card that you have for the greatest talent because that that is your biggest expense is the greatest talent. But then in actual fact, the barrier for a family to remove their child of, from one school and move them into another school <clears throat> like is so small. It's just like, okay, okay we're just going to move from here to here, which means that people will go – to the ones who are winning, like a Halebury getting what, like eight students with 99.95. It's like, well, I'm going to go where that is. But then that's going to drive that market up too. And so it's, it's really interesting that I agree that the schools are probably going to decrease, teaching will decrease, but the ones who are very good at do, doing this delivery and very good at specializing in whatever sort of thing they're teaching in, they will do very well out of this because there is, there's a demand. There will need to be a demand. It's like, oh, your students do really, 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 really well. Come over here because you're, it's almost like a celebrity. You're the draw card that's going to pull the students in, right? So it's almost like building an A-class team of just these great people. Absolutely. I, I'm very excited by this. Can I, can I make a prediction or speculation? Let's do it. I actually feel what's going to come out of this from a business front is, you know how we have like co-working? For like where we work, yep. I think we work type facilities in towns for kids to go to to go to their remote school will become a thing. I am. Um, I spoke to somebody about this exact thing about a year ago, and what it was, it was a testing facility for students, and so the students will come in. So essentially, a school will rent this place out. And they have kind of, I don't want to say babysitters, but I call them babysitters, which are just people who are there to make sure that you're on the computer, you're not distracted and you're kind of doing the thing. And if you really have like a rudimentary question, they're like, how, how can I do this? How can I log in here? Blah, blah, blah. They're there to help. And that was it. It was like this, it was like going to, what is it? A commissary, a commissary which is like a ghost kitchen, right? You go, cool, I want to borrow it from these times, walk in, cook a meal, happy days. And so I agree, like those co-working spaces, which just have people there, sort of making sure everyone's tech set up and their videos set up and all those kind of things. I agree. I, and I already know that some of them are starting to exist out of necessity during COVID. I don't know where they're at now, but you're right. If this thing continues to barrel forwards, it's like, cool, let's go and send our kids to these locations that then a heap of children are across multiple schools, right? Like it's almost school agnostic, which I think, I think it's fantastic. I'll throw it out there as well. Business opportunities. I think tutoring is going to become bigger. Massive. Yeah. So I think if you're in the tutoring industry or supporting kids with online learning, that's going to become a thing. Um, I'm not sure this is going to roll out as much in primary schools, 
because I think that um, that's a little bit different, but the high school front, particularly in higher education front, I can just see more and more of this coming through. Yeah, especially towards the the later years. Like I, I remember talking to some people that are close to me that went through uh, their last like year 11, year 12 during COVID and they reckon that they studied more and that they were more attentive because they were so worried and they just didn't have distractions like going out to people's like 18th birthdays and things like that. So I actually think that there is this ability to get a little bit more education in, but also as, as long as you've got that sort of good process or that good habit of really sort of learning or getting a child to learn, I think that's where that's going to be the next friction point, which is why I think those schooling sort of co-working spaces, if you will, is so powerful. We shall see. Now, next point, Charlie, I'm actually going to, I'm going to hand this one over to you. So I'm going to let you do the community shout out for this time because I, I, I like do it you. all the time and I don't want to steal all of the thunder. So I'll let you do this one. All right. So this week I wanted to give a shout out to Joe. Um, often on the email list and the newsletter, I say, hey, if you've got a question, can you please send it in? I'd love to hear more about it and we might discuss it on the podcast. So Joe has sent me a really um, – how would I almost describe a great email? He sent it back and he said, Hey, this is my situation. These are the things I'm thinking about and considering. And here's a couple of questions. Now, by no means am I giving financial advice in those emails or anything like that, but we're actually going to break down his email and go into some things that I think will be very helpful for Joe in one of the upcoming episodes. So if you do want to send in questions or give us, um, what's going on in your world and what you're thinking about or considering, if appropriate, Grant and I will definitely cover on the podcast and expand upon because we want to help the people to listen. Like we make this for the audience, not for ourselves. Yeah. And it was, as we always say, we are basically an extension of your network. We're all in this together. So we are an email away, a, a Facebook group message away. So Joe, be on the lookout for that episode because I've, I've, seen, I've seen the questions. I'm actually looking forward to sinking my teeth into it. It's going to be Really awesome. good questions. Uh, so let's wrap this one up, Charlie. Uh, but for everyone tuning in, be sure to check out for the new episodes coming out. We drop two of them every single week. And if you're not already, make sure that you are on the newsletter so you can actually reply back to Charlie and ask him some questions. This newsletter is designed to enhance your full stack of skills to build wealth inside and outside your business. So go to fullstackbusinessowner.com forward slash newsletter, put in your details, and we'll notify you all the time when we release these things. And if you did enjoy the show, be sure to go and subscribe or even share it to someone else who you know that would actually get value from what we've just shared in this episode. And I just want to say thank you again for joining us and we look forward to catching you on the next episode of Full Stack Business Owner.